Hello, and this week on the channel, we are talking about biases, uh, unconscious biases that writers might have that they put into their work, uh, biases that readers might have, when, and they inflict those biases on works that they read, uh, deconstructing biases, social biases, everything related to biases we are going to talk about this week. And uh, I want to give a shout out to Diana Pingicha, author of A Curse of Roses, coming out December uh, this year, 2020, from Entangled, because she slipped into my D DMs earlier this week and said, we should have a panel on biases and deconstructing biases. And I said, that is a fantastic idea. Let me get some of the coolest people together and talk about this really important topic. Uh, so I'm joined this week by Lisa Weimer, author of The Assignment, coming out August 25th from Delacorte. And I'm also joined by Naz Kutub, who is a author mentor match mentor and who writes really fantastic YA novels about gay Muslim teens and all sorts of, oh, there's just so many things in your work that can be discussed and I'm excited to hear you discuss them. I'm also joined by Laura Amin, who is a sensitivity reader for disability and who also is a writer and has some short stories out and uh, works at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in the, the archives. And you guys are going to introduce yourselves very soon. But welcome to the channel. And I can't wait to talk about this important topic with you all. So uh, I'd like you all to introduce yourselves and tell us about your book and your writing and what you're doing. So starting with Lisa. All right. Um, so it's backwards, but uh, um, this is the assignment, and I'm very excited to say that it comes out August 25th. Um, it was inspired by a true story. I happened to have been um, in the Syracuse, New York area when um, I found out that two teens refused to do an assignment advocating for the Holocaust. And I, it turns out, um, just out of a series of very... Um, uh, serendipitous moments where I happened to be in this small town when this unfolded. Um, I met the teens, um, one in person and then the other on the phone, and that inspired me to create a fish fictionalized story about uh, an assignment that students uh, received where they're asked to advocate, pretend that they're Nazis, and um, advocate for either exterminating Europe's 11 million Jews or um, putting them in work camps, ghettos, um, or concentration camps. And um, so, yeah, very powerful topic. That, that, that is shocking that it actually like happens in mm -hmm. current, the current day and age, uh, but, I'm really eager to talk with you about how you go about exploring that in a fictional plot structure. Uh, so I can't wait to talk to you about that more. Uh, Diana, uh, introduce yourself. Hey everyone, I'm Diana Pingisha and I'm the author of A Curse of Roses, which is a retelling of my hometown's legend where the Princess of Aragon turns everything that's food into flowers. And so she must learn to reverse that curse. And to do so, she gets the help of an enchanted Mora, which were typically uh, more princesses that were trapped because of circumstances that happened way back. Uh, and it comes out December 1st this year from Entangled. And, and your book deals with uh, female, female relationships, lesbian oh, relationships. Oh yeah, it in, is It is a lesbian book. In ancient <laughs> Portugal. and <laughs> Not ancient, ancient, I think the 1300s. The, the 1300s. Middle Ages, Middle Ages, when it was fun to be gay, it turns out. 
-hmm. So you have a lot to say on, on the topic of on the topic your of representation biases. in historical settings. Yeah. Awesome. And Naz, go ahead and introduce yourself. I am, oh gosh, I feel like you said everything already. Like I write <laughs> a young adult mainly. Uh, I try to focus on LGBTQ youth um, and uh, just, you know, throw in aspects of what I grew up with being Muslim and uh, the issues of growing up. Uh, I think your books do a really good job of confronting white supremacy and white privilege. Oh, and, really? <laughs> and addressing uh, it, you know, and, and putting a little, a little highlighter on it and saying like, you know, and, it, and that's an important bias I think we can discuss. Yeah, I think, I think it's important to address um, like how the playing field is not level at all for, mm -hmm. you know, people of color, LGBTQ, the disabled, and, you know, anyone who has marginalization. Um, and I'm glad that, you know, every aspect of media is trying to address this slowly. Um, and I'm trying to put that into my work as well. So, like, mm -hmm. I try to have a diverse cast of characters in what I write. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting what you said about the, the playing field being not level, because we certainly live in a society that claims uh, mm. to be <laughs> a land of equality. You know, we mm. live in uh, a country right. that claims and really pushes that narrative that we're in a land of equality. But your books do a really good job of acknowledging that, uh, that equality is not not quite there and because of biases uh, mm. the struggles of marginalized people often get uh, diminished mm -hmm. or you know pushed to the side yeah yeah we'll talk about all of that <laughs> so lara introduce yourself hi i'm lara amin i'm a sensitivity reader i did sensitivity reading for Carly's book, The Reckless Kind. I've done other sensitivity reading for novels. I did one for a podcast, uh, audio drama podcast. I can do it for screenplays too. I haven't done it yet for screenplays. The one book that I did sensitivity reading for that was published that's out right now is a middle grade contemporary called uh, Martin McLean Middle School Queen. And it has a character who uses a wheelchair. She's a uh, Vietnamese, a uh, Vietnamese adoptee, and she uses a wheelchair. Um, so I did sensitivity reading for that character. And the other books that I've done sensitivity reading for haven't come out yet. But um, I do sensitivity reading. I'm a PhD student at Chapman University, uh, studying disability representation in the media. And I just passed my qualifying exams. So I get to do my dissertation now wow. on uh, disability representation in media and interviewing disabled actors. And I, I write TV drama pilots and uh, young adult and adult fiction. I, across mediums, I pretty much write fantasy. Um, but I have a short story in, I don't know if you can see it here, Disabled Voices hmm. Anthology. Uh, my story is called Night Terrors. And I mostly write, um, uh, queer disabled characters and lately I've been writing more like queer disabled Jewish characters and sort of trying to get more in touch with the Jewish aspect of my identity and what that means and what that means as a teenager and I just finished my first first draft of a novel that's a contemporary fantasy about a queer Jewish disabled teen who's a bounty hunter. Great. Mm. Oh, can't wait for that one. So this is a good time to get into questions. I'd like to hear from all of you. What do we mean when we talk about bias? Who wants to jump in? What do we mean by bias? That moment of awkward silence. <laughs> well, it's a big topic. It's I think I um, bias is your when you prejudge something based on sometimes a feeling, sometimes something that's been um, taught to you, but it's a way to prejudge something instinctively, I think. It's a way to kind of put more weight onto a one piece of information rather than another, right? That would be a good way of explaining it too. Um, some biases can be unconscious, right? Some biases mm. can be conscious. 
Um, They're not all biases are bad. I mean, just right. because you're biased toward cats doesn't mean dogs are bad. <laughs> right. Some biases think, are innocent. But. So I think biases, uh, biases generally tend to form based on the lived or the learned experience, right? It's like <laughs> what, like if it's an unconscious bias, it's something maybe you grew up with, like say you saw your parent have a heart attack and you know you have to eat healthy and then you instantly judge people who don't eat healthy or go to McDonald's and like, oh, how can you do, how can you eat that junk without realizing that a huge part of like um, people living in poverty can only afford like food that is unhealthy because it's just so much cheaper to produce like chicken breast is so much more expensive than chicken thighs you know, just mm -hmm. as a comparison. So like, like that is formed out of a learned experience, a lived experience. But like Diana said, it could also be something that's, it doesn't have to be negative. It can be something that's positive also. Mm -hmm. I don't have an example in my head, but it's just something that mm -hmm. I think comes out of a lived or learned experience. I mean, some, one example of a positive bias would be, um, I, I would definitely hope that, uh, well, in some ways, the gatekeeping of media uh, will hopefully um, understand that not all sides of a story are relevant. For instance, mm. um, if there is an attack on someone from a marginalized identity group by a white supremacist um, saying, well, there's bad people on both sides mm. and being egalitarian that way would be problematic. But, but, you know, having a bias, I guess you could say that puts more weight on the experience of the victim. Uh, mm. And, you know, uh, that, that would be a case I would say where a bias is probably a good thing, you know? Um, uh, Lisa, do you I have being, anything? When you're biased towards, a, in favor of a marginalized group, it's in a way that bias helps level the playing field. Mm. Mm -hmm. I know. Mm -hmm. But in, in society at large, there is a, a, a really strong push. It's almost like a, a, you know, the flow of the discourse in, you know, the general kind of population tends to favor certain identities over others. For instance, mm. cis men tend to be favored, their voices, their presence, their stories, their way of viewing the world tends to be favored over people of other genders. Mm. Uh, similarly, the white experience, uh, in media, in uh, whether it's news or journalism or in um, social media or in fiction, tends to be favored over the, the point of view and perspectives of people who are not white. So this is kind of an example of, you know, there's this, this really strong bias that really gets ingrained in us from the time that we're born mm. um, that is something that we all live with and experience. And, and sometimes though, you know, whether, whether it's the media or whether it's society pushes us to believe, oh no, everyone's equal. But when in reality, um, the truth is that certain voices do get highlighted over others. So much of that has to do with the quest for power. Mm -hmm. And um, we see this with, um, you know, what, what our society is going through right now with the coronavirus and how uh, certain communities, um, the POC community, uh, is not because of laws that are in place and because of what has transpired, um, is in a position of um, a disproportionate uh, amount of um, angst and um, poor care, and so much of that is rooted in power. Mm -hmm. And so through my research um, for the assignment, the realization is uh, that people use bias uh, to manipulate. They use uh, power to gain control over others. And um, 
to devalue other people's lives um, by spreading lies. And um, so we have an obligation to recognize that, um, and Carly, you were um, alluding to this, in that there are certain things that you need to recognize that you never cross that line. And it's, there's, it's the concept of cognizant um, uh, dissidence and that um, when you face certain moral um, issues, like for example, genocide, mm -hmm. um, you have to look at it from the perspective of that you should never um, justify the um, unjustifiable. Mm -hmm. Do not defend the indef um, indefensible. Genocide is one of those things. So in a situation with my novel where um, a debate was set up, just the concept of a debate means that there is a possibility that those sides could have justification for their, for their reasons. With bias, we have to understand that some lines should never be crossed. And that is what it relates to. Yeah, the uh, yeah there is not an, e an there's not an equal both sides situation mm -hmm. when it comes to genocide, when it comes to racism, when it comes to sexism. There's no both sides. There's no oh let's let's give the benefit of the doubt and let's hear out what the you know the oppressors have to say. You know that's that's certainly a case where we're going to hopefully prioritize the point of view of the victim in the situation. And I love that Lisa, Lisa's work is so clearly about this. And Lisa already touched on this next question, which is how does bias show up in fictional works? And I'm, I'm first thinking of the, the dominant narrative, the dominant lens that we are given mm. as we as as we look at media, and the fact that gatekeepers in media um, in the past have tended to be white Christian cis men, and so the lens of the dominant um, white cis you know uh, cis male Christian paradigm has been what has been published in the past. And so we're starting to kind of dismantle that, that gatekeeping a little bit, but we can certainly see the dominant lens in a lot of work. Um, so what types of biases do you see uh, in the fiction that you guys read, that you all read? See that, see what I did? I said guys, <laughs> because that's how language has been constructed to prioritize men. <laughs> so I need to get in the habit of saying sailors. So I'll go first, since you are obviously referring to me. Uh, no, I'll open the floor to everyone. You anyone? can go first, totally. All right, I'll go first. Um, so the one thing that I'm very proud about um, is children's literature. I feel like children's literature in the US especially, is really paving the way for like opening up to marginalizations. I think there are more like LGBTQ books being published, POC. Um, uh, I have a disabled friend who just sold her book. So like I think children's lit, kid lit is definitely on the forefront of like leveling. It's getting better. Things. Yeah, it's getting better. It's <laughs> definitely, the numbers, it's always trending upwards, right? Where if it's 9% three years ago, it's 10% this year, it's getting better. It's still not equal mm -hmm. um, compared to like TV or the rest of Hollywood. Um, that said, I think the main bias that still exists is that even though it's trying to trend towards the direction of good, they from what I hear, from what, more diverse, more representation. Yeah, more representation of yeah. the population. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, there's still a great demand for issue books, like books mm -hmm. that deal with Pain. that marginalization being a huge problem and like overcoming it, as opposed to like 
books that deal with joy, like those mm-hmm. characters and the joy that they come that they uh, that they have from being those characters. Mm-hmm. So you know, I still have friends who get editors who say like, "I would like this to be more about this. Are you willing to explore that?" And you know, I have friends who are okay with it, and friends who are like, "No, I don't want to go there. I mm-hmm. want this book to be about this." So I think there's still that bias that mm-hmm. will probably not go away for a while. Um, but I hope that there will be And more. I also think that even though it's getting better in terms of more diverse works being acquired, uh, there's a lot of... Um, not... I mean, what do I mean to say? Ah, God damn it, words come to me. I'm a writer, I swear I know how to string words together. <laughs> Um, so they, they acquire, and you see a lot of marginalized, uh, books by marginalized people being acquired, but they're not being promoted. Mm. So in terms of marketing, there's still a huge bias in favor Mm. of the cis white hat experience in Mm. some books are deservedly hyped by marginalized people, but the bulk of them are just acquired sometimes for a lot of money, which comes with a Mm. lot of expectations and then marketing does nothing with them Mm. and so those authors careers end up stalling because your book didn't sell when Mm -hmm. it's not the author's fault Mm -hmm. something Uh, i they're still in marketing the bias yeah something i see that's that's Mm -hmm. kind of disappointing because the majority of people now in publishing are women so you think that things would be better for the representation of women but there's still a lot of male-centric narratives um, in publishing, and not necessarily male-centric in that the main character is male, but the, uh, but there's a, the way that women are described versus the way that men are described in books Mm. uh, tends to be, you know, the women heavily focused on their appearance um, and heavily focused on the woman really needing to prove that she's a good person. Whereas the male character can be messy. The male character can be, you know, really problematic in a lot of ways and people will love him. But the female character, if she does one thing wrong, she is a villain and she's hated. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Of course, she's also gay. (laughs) <laughs> well, <laughs> well, and you know, I, and I kind of had had that experience too, where um, it, w- with disability fiction, there does seem to be a priority for um, a hierarchy. They, they, people put mm-hmm. this lens that there's a hierarchy of disability, um, and that people who have disabilities from birth. Uh, their disabilities are not as important as acquired disabilities. Mm. When a character has an acquired disability, that is tragic and that mm-hmm. it becomes really important. And if the disabled character is male, oh, he is, he is a very important character. Whereas if mm. the disabled character is a female, she is, she is not as important, especially if she had a, you know, a, uh, um, I can't even say congenital disability mm. versus if she has an acquired disability. The congenital disability is not as important as the acquired disability. Because you're going for like a curability oh. narrative. Wait, someone dropped that. We lost oh Lisa. no, I think we might oh, have we lost Lisa. Lisa. Hopefully yeah. she'll log back in. Yeah. I, you know, it could be that there's a, a little bit of a uh, a little <laughs> a little internet, the internet problem. Act- acting up. But the, hopefully she comes back. Uh, so any other final words on, um, on how biases might show up in fictional work? We're, I mean, there's millions of ways, but those I mean, are some ways that pop I, into my head. I, I was agreeing with Naz. I think that diversity in terms of, I think in YA, it's a lot more prevalent in terms of like diversity than in like adult fiction. Like I can list, like I can give like a lecture or something on, you know, disability rep and YA fiction, but I don't really find many books in adult fiction that have disability representation, especially multifaceted disability representation. Mm -hmm. Like you have to be white and, you know, male, or you have to be, you know, white woman, or you have to be this certain way, or you have to have like, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, 
you know, you have to be paralyzed and it has to be cured or yeah. something versus mm -hmm. like, there are palatable narratives that only people will accept and they, you can't like, people just can't go on adventures and be themselves and be queer and disabled and people of color and be proud. Mm -hmm. They have to like fit into a box that like confines them sort of. And mm -hmm. I think that that is entrenched with bias and that comes from a history of like Carly and everyone else was saying like this you know I also want to say eugenics was a big part of mm -hmm. that as well and like not just white supremacy but like this whole thing that we have to create this perfect I hate to say race but perfect you know group of people that can't mm -hmm. have deformities or mm -hmm. can't be different they all have to be homogenous and the same but who wants that that's boring right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it, it, yeah, the idea that, um, you know, anyone who doesn't fit the typical description mm -hmm. of a person, uh, you know, an abled person is broken, or, um, you know, not it, less than, you know, mm -hmm. that you just don't, you know, and it's really interesting, because in my life, in our lives, we probably have, you know, a large percentage of our friend group has disabilities, like whether it's uh, unseen disability, like anxiety or depression yeah. or endometriosis or hearing yeah. loss, um, or, you know, a physical visual disability. Mm -hmm. But when you look at media and you look at fiction, you don't see that represented yeah. at all. Or you see it done very badly. <laughs> and it's very, it, it, or it's very, it's like one character you know because yeah. it has a disability if i can say one more thing about yeah. this um so i think the older we get the more deep-seated our biases our unconscious mm -hmm. biases become right like mm -hmm. and i think that's why with the adult um book segment like it's really hard you it's really hard to get adult readers to to steer away from what they're reading or what they're interested in whereas i think with like young adult books I think publishers are willing to take chances on like new ideas, new topics, more like diversity, because I think the younger mind is just more malleable, more pliable and more conducive to accepting new ideas. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would just, you know, I hope it trickles upwards. <laughs> well, I, th I think also the um, Z generation uh, of, of kids is really, with it. they are i think gen z is like going to be the greatest generation like <laughs> I, I teach you know because i teach gen z kids now and they are so much more open-minded yeah like, than we were oh my god it is yeah. so nice to see and, them and they're also really like because they've lived their whole lives on the internet so they mm. know yeah everything yeah and they they will like bring out the social justice discourse with eloquent eloquent clarity and you know i'm just sitting back and taking notes i'm like okay <laughs> <laughs> the gen z's like got it so oh trust me like sometimes i'm like do i really want to write ya when i feel like i you know i need to do so much research on their voice and their thoughts and i'm like well we'll see we'll give it a try you yeah. Know. All I'm gonna say is, if you write middle grade, those poop jokes are gonna land. <laughs> they all, always they invariably laugh, laugh oh, yeah. at poop. Well, we, could, we should have a whole nother panel on gen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The yeah. things I learned how, from my students. How wise oh they God. are. Lisa's back. Lisa's, Lisa's back. back. Lisa's back. Probably had to restart like a Windows 10 forced update. Yeah. Oh gosh. Oh. As soon as Lisa gets I'm, back, I'm on the a screen, Windows girl and I saw We are going to talk I'm about uh, what advice would you give to She's writers? She's muted, Lisa. You're muted. Oh, there you are, Lisa. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Hi, I am. Welcome Hi. Back. Hi. Back. Thank you. Um, um, so this. Uh, so since you're back, uh, I'm going to shoot the next question at you. Okay. Uh, what advice would you give to writers on, on confronting biases in fiction like if someone wants to write a book about confronting bias you know confronting prejudice confronting bias how would they go about doing that what advice would you give to them 
Um, I First of all, I think it's very important for us to um, be very cognizant of the world around us. We all have bias um, and we have to we have to really work hard to recognize what our own bias, uh, what our own biases are, um, because it infiltrates into our writing. And I want to give an example um, that kind of related to your last question. Mm -hmm. So I was not aware until um, early February uh, about ableist language. Mm -hmm. um, I. Um, Lara, I know you, you have addressed this, um, but ableist language is language like, um, for example, saying something is lame or saying crazy or insane. And I consider myself a, a sensitive person and a very caring person. But until I saw a tweet about ableist language and recognizing that I didn't quite understand what that meant, um, I took it upon myself to discover and to learn more about that. And then I confronted it in my own novel. Mm -hmm. And I um, contacted my editor and I said, I, I want to, you know, go through my novel. I want to pull ableist language out of my novel. And the truth is, um, it wasn't necessarily always so easy. Um, so, for example, on, on the cover of my novel, the tagline originally was, would you stand up for what is right? And that got changed to, would you speak up for what is right? Perfect. And so I think that um, we also have to recognize the following. I believe that the majority of children's authors are good, caring people. I think the majority of us really care about getting it right. We're gonna make mistakes, we know that, we've seen it. I think we need to be kind and compassionate to people um, I, as I said, I, I was given the opportunity to go through my novel and um, I had a very short, you know, window of time to do so because of publishing constraints. Um, I know that I like gave it my heart and soul um, to make those changes and to be sensitive and I needed to be sensitive because that's what a good human being does. And so, um, but I also think that there are times that we've got to be gentle with each other and help each other out and lift each other out up mm -hmm. and to recognize that the majority of people make mistakes mm -hmm. and um, we have to help each other to do better. Definitely. Can, I speak, can I speak to this? Yes, definitely. I have a specific story that follows, that follows Lisa's, Okay, I, I have a story. Um, I, it wasn't a sensitivity reading experience, but it was sort of like I was, I had called out a friend or someone I had considered a friend at one point. Um, she's not a published author yet, but she wants to be published. And I'd been friends with this person for a while and I'd called her out on her use of ableist language in her novel. Like, I wasn't mean about it. I was just saying like, hey, like this is ableist, don't like, you know, there are other words to use. Like and I said it and I, what I thought, you know, as much as I could over the internet because we weren't speaking, you know, over the phone or face to face. I thought I had said it in a way that like wouldn't hurt her or wouldn't, you know, uh, hurt her feelings. Um, but this is what happened. And I feel like this was an important conversation to bring up in bias. I called her out and she said, well, um, and, and she's white and I, I mean, so am I, but she said, well, I can fix, you know, I have no problems fixing the racist language and all the other parts of the language, but you know, kind of like, why do I have to fix this? Like, does this mean I'm ableist? Does this, yeah, she really like, it was like, does this mean I'm ableist? Does this mean, you know, da da da? And she really got angry with me for calling her out. And I said, 
it doesn't make you a bad writer. It doesn't make you a bad person. I'm just, if I had written something harmful that was racist or that was something like, I would want to know, mm-hmm. you know, so I'm trying to do something the same for you. And she got angry with me. So I agree with Lisa that, you know, whether it's a friend or it's, you know, a colleague or whatever, your beta reading, your sensitivity reading, like, even when I call, have corrected ableist language when I do sensitivity reads, I'm not mean about it. I just say, hey, can you use the word ridiculous, bizarre? Like, I give them word suggestions. I'm like, hey, instead of this word, try this. Instead of this phrasing, maybe try this. Like, you're still saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when it comes to ableism specifically, I've gotten a lot of this, is that, oh, it doesn't exist. Oh, it doesn't it's not real Mm -hmm. and what bothers me about that is if you fail to understand that ableism exists at all then you fail to understand how it exists with racism with sexism with all these other forms of oppression if you're saying it doesn't exist at all and that is my big beef Mm -hmm. as a like when i think about bias and i think about correcting someone's ableist language i'm not doing it because i'm mean or I want to hurt somebody. I'm doing it because I want to make someone's story better, you know, because we all see stereotypes and we all see things that, that, you know, should, that are not done in a certain way or portrayed correctly. We all want to help each other and make it better. But if people are not willing to, you know, say, oh, I screwed up, you know, and oh, I can fix that now. And I'm so glad that Lisa, you know, spoke to her editor and said, hey, I want to fix this. Like, I kept telling Carly in reading The Reckless Kind, I was like, oh my God, this is so great. I, there's no ableist language in here. I never had to come to the open. It was fantastic. I mean, even my own work, I look back at my old scripts and I'm like, oh, I used the word crazy. Like, and that makes me not perfect, but that means, okay, I know going forward, I won't use that language anymore, or I'll fix my language, I'll use Patronus instead of Spirit, and I'll fix these things about my language, but if people like this person I once considered my friend are not willing to look at that, that is a problem. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I I did get some pushback, and I just wanted to make one quick comment, and that is that language is constantly evolving, and that's Mm -hmm. my answer to people that we're not using the same kind of language that we were using in the 60s and 70s. And mm-hmm. I think that ableist language is one of those things that we really need to be aware of. And we as authors have an obligation, I believe, to work to help um, language evolve. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, and most importantly, to not harm others with mm. language. And, the, uh, and that's nice of you to say, Laura, that I didn't have a, labelist language, but I must admit in earlier drafts, I did. And in earlier drafts, I had scenes that uh, I realized after educating myself needed to be revised in order to um, make the representation a little bit more accurate and also a a little bit more um, sensitive to, and also just, you know, just I want my work to be empowering to someone who's of a marginalized identity and who has a disability that's more severe than mine to, or more obvious than mine, because disability shouldn't be ranked by levels of severity, but, um, but yeah, that I, that I want to be empowering and earlier drafts needed to be checked and needed to be revised. And hence that's why I have, had multiple sensitivity readers, including you, Lara. And um, thank you so much for, for educating me on the things that needed to be improved, because I, I definitely appreciate that. And I think this is a good point to kind of uh, wrap things up. Um, I think our goal as writers is to not harm, right? And hopefully also to address, because that's really what fiction does, is we address uh, the things that might go unnoticed uh, and maybe highlight the like an important perspective or important point of view and usually we have something that we want to say in our work and you know 
and, and maybe do a little educating, do a little, um, a little finessing of the narrative to make the world a better place. So any final thoughts as we wrap things up? I would love Diana to share this, that amazing website she shared oh. with all of mm -hmm. us. Um, Diana, oh. Okay, so if you're wondering what biases, um, what biases affect your mm. thinking and your views of the world, there's this great resource called yourbias.is. Your bias is. You mm. have a nifty, nifty name. Yes. And there have a lot of them that you can look at, like the negativity bias, which I myself fall to. That was a fun coincidence. Uh, we were talking about in our little chat before how most writers are affected by the sunk cost fallacy in that we spend so much time with our books that sometimes it's time to let go of an idea mm. or an entire book, but we've spent so much time on it that we don't want to. And they also have like questions you can ask yourself to change your way of thinking so the bias doesn't affect affect you as much yes and that is it they also have i think one for political fallacies or mm. philosophical fallacies that's also pretty great it's your fallacy that is yeah i but, I really enjoyed looking at this website mm. um i had a fun time looking at it. it's like oh my god yeah. i fall to so many of these i need to stop I it's learned like, a lot. I, I thought it was yeah. amazing. And I was so the spotlight grateful. effect is real. Yeah. It's yeah. funny how you look at all of these biases and you're like, oh, I am not faultless. <laughs> you know, I'm not perfect. Mm -hmm. And, and we I all... really, I really enjoy, like, I write fantasy. That's my number one love. And if when you spend a lot of time world building, you have like all the rules in your mm. head. And then you just assume that the reader already knows as much as you do. And that's the curse of knowledge. I also do. It is the curse that. of knowledge. Like, that's why, like, children can produce such imaginative worlds and, like, word pairings and, like, ideas. And you're like, wow, that's really cool. As an adult, you have compartmentalized everything and adopted so many biases that it's so hard to come up and with. I also found that... It took me a while to realize this, but when I finally became an adult, I understood that not everyone has the same education that I do. So mm -hmm. I should just stop assuming everyone knows yeah. the same things I do, especially because I remember <laughs> almost everything. Yeah. And well, not everyone is like me. So that's my number one thing now is like, no one else is me. No one else knows what I do. So. And that I was one to. of the things that I learned while I was researching um, my novel is that I thought I knew a lot about anti-Semitism um, mm. and uh, other, you know, like racism and uh, xenophobia and um, anti-LGBTQIAP. I, I felt like I had had a solid basis of knowledge. And the more you research and the more you learn, the more you realize there is so much more to learn. And yeah. I, I really feel that we need to be open um, mm -hmm. and to recognize that we are here to spend, God willing, a very long lifetime mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. you know, learning. Um, and we have to be open to that. And so even though I, you know, certainly would say that I know a lot more about this topic uh, since before I started the novel. There are other people that I have um, the opportunity to learn um, from, so. As much as you know about something, someone else will always know more. That's yeah. true, that's yeah. true. And that's, and I think that's part of being a writer, right? Is to learn, is, is to open up our knowledge. I mean, Big part of writing is the research. So the more that we know and that we learn and the more we talk to different people that are outside of our experiences, the more our knowledge base is like, oh, and when we write books and different things, you're always going to learn different things that you didn't know before. And hopefully that influences, that makes our writing, you know, better and stronger. Mm. 
definitely. And uh, that's a great place to end things for today. Thank you all so much for joining me. And uh, viewers, if you like this content, be sure to give the channel a subscribe and hit the bell. I'm gonna put your guys, your, see I did it again, guys. <laughs> I'm going to put your, your social media. You can say y'all. Thanks. Yeah. You, you would be like so screwed if you were Portuguese because Portuguese has no gender neutral for anything. <laughs> Everything is gendered and we talk about needing a gender neutral and then, you know, old school people, eh, but we don't have it. Well, mm. language is evolved, like mm -hmm. Lisa said. Language Maybe it's time evolved. we add gender neutral. Right. Language has evolved to be more inclusive <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, I need to work on making my slang more inclusive and that's, this is like the second time I've tried to remove that word from my vocabulary. But uh, thank you all for, for joining me today and uh, I'm going to put uh, links in down below. Be sure to give everyone here a follow and uh, I will be connecting with you all on the social media. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay.